My name is Marcia Smith. I am the president and co-founder of Firelight Media, which is a 20-year-old organization that exists to uh, support filmmakers of color, documentary filmmakers of color, which we do in a variety of ways. Our sister organization, Firelight Films, is a production company headed by my partner, Stanley Nelson. Welcome all to the August 7th edition of Beyond Resilience. Uh, Firelight started Beyond Resilience as a web series of curated conversations that explore the challenges, strategies, and experiences of creating and distributing work during a time of crisis. Our slate of conversation ta conversations takes a global and historical view of films created by filmmakers of color during critical periods of disaster or other crisis, seeking to learn from the filmmakers, their communities, and the resilience born from collective experiences. This August 7th edition will be uh, the last for a few weeks. Beyond Resilience will be going on the road. Uh, we'll be sharing more information of how to tune in to digital film festivals we'll be joining, such as Black Star, um, and the IDA's Getting Real Conference that will be taking place in the fall. So we'll please, uh, if you're not on our list, please do sign up so that we can keep you up to date on that. Um, we'd like to start with a land acknowledgement for the purposes of raising awareness of indigenous presence and land rights. We all have the responsibility to consider what it means to acknowledge the history and the legacy of colonialism. I am right now in Oak Bluffs, Massachusetts on the land of the Wampanoag people. And we encourage all of you to make land acknowledgements in the chat, just drop in there if you will, uh, uh, the name of the people on whose land you now sit. Uh, we'd like to welcome back Andrea Lust, who is our ASL interpreter. Um, we have a great program today um, in honor of the great John Lewis, who we lost just a few weeks ago, and whose legacy is alive and well um, in all of us and in the hearts of the young people who have been in the streets. Um, we wanted very much to do this program and we have a, a wonderful um, group here. I, my role is, is simply to introduce a moderator for the day who is my good friend, Judith Brown Dianis. Judith, did you wave, Judith? Hi. Judith is the Executive Director of Advancement Project National Office. She has served as a lawyer, a professor, a civil rights advocate in the movement for racial justice for decades now. You may have also seen her on television recently. She's hailed as a voting rights expert and a pioneer in the movement to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. In her role heading Advancement Project's national office, Judith leads work to combat structural racism in education, voting, policing, criminal justice, and immigration. Since joining Advancement Project at its inception in 1999, she has worked with grassroots organizations to wage successful campaigns using litigation, advocacy, and communications. She authored groundbreaking education reports, including Opportunities Suspended and Derailed the Schoolhouse to Jailhouse Track, detailing the unnecessary criminalization of students by their own schools. Advancement Project National Office's work with grassroots partners significantly helped decrease student suspensions and arrests in Denver, Baltimore, and school districts throughout Florida. Um, I just want to welcome Judith as our moderator today um, and want to say, in, in addition to all the formal bio language, um, I think Many of us know the term school to prison pipeline because of Judith's work. I just want to say that I know she's been um, working that theme, that particular theme for many, many years now, in addition to her work on voting rights, um, all of which has been in collaboration with communities and has been very impactful. So Judith, please take it away. 
Thank you, Marsha. Um, I'm really excited about this conversation we're going to have today. Um, as a voting rights lawyer, as a um, person who started off in the work as a, as a student organizer, uh, as someone who um, revered um, Congressman John Lewis and had time to spend with him, and anyone who spent any time with him knows that he just rubs off on you. And so um, I am really excited to be in conversation with two incredible filmmakers um, who have documented his work, his life, his legacy, um, what he means to all of us. And I'm gonna say this, I, I'm not going to promise you that I am not going to cry during <laughs> this discussion um, because I've been a little sensitive about um, losing someone who was so special. Um, anyone who actually also worked on the Hill and saw him on the Hill, it, it, it feels like such a vacuum um, without him and the idea that there isn't someone there who is the, is the moral conscience of Congress. I mean, there's lots of great people, um, but there is something very special about him. So I wanna jump right into this conversation. Um, you know, I, as a, as a voting rights lawyer, um, know how important um, the role was that he played in voting rights, but I also know that we need to talk about him beyond voting rights and that um, in the moment that we're in also, he started off as a young person. I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Stanley, I think the letter that he wrote to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, was when he was 17 years old, uh, which is the same age as my daughter. Um, and he was ready um, to get in good trouble. And so I want to start there, um, Stanley and Dawn. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with the two of you um, who um, really got in the weeds on knowing him from both Freedom Fighters, um, the film Freedom Fighters, to um, the film Good Trouble, which is just recently out um, and an incredible piece of work for both of them. And I want to start, Stanley, um, with talking some about John Lewis, the young man. Um, how did he get involved? Why did he get involved? Yeah, I mean, we'll, I, we'll see a, a clip of, of his letter, you know, as, as he, I think he's 18 and he leaves college um, to join the Freedom Riders. And, you know, um, he was just one of uh, 13 people that, that went on the, the Freedom Rides. I, I believe he was the youngest person on, on the Freedom Rides. And, you know, he, he felt at that moment that he had a calling. Uh, to, to become part of, of this movement. And, um, you know, it was a calling that lasted the rest of his life. Um, and so this is kind of the beginning in so many ways for, for John. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it really began years earlier, you know, um, with, you know, how he was raised and, you know, what he saw as a young man. But, but this is, uh, you know, the, the moment that, that he, he decides that the movement is, is, is more important than, than college. Mm -hmm. um, so Don, if you could add, and then we're going to go to a clip of, um, that Stanley referred to, but wanted to bring you into this, like, you know, the young, I mean, you, you even go back to like the preaching to the chickens, um, which is just like, just a whole lovely idea. If you know him, just, I could just see him doing it. Um, but talk a little bit about, um, John Lewis, the, the young John Lewis. Yeah, um, and, and thank you so much for moderating. And of course, thank you for your work, which has been just at the cornerstone of what will save us, <laughs> we oh, hope. So Advancement Project is really at the center of so much. And I hope folks will take some time to learn more about them. Um, so, you know, as, as Stanley said, like Congressman Lewis, um, I, his family describes him as always a little bit different. Um, I think he was a man of great faith. So the preaching he wanted, you know, he didn't want to preach and the chickens were, you know, an, a welcome audience. But I think like many teenagers, certainly we're seeing that this today. Um, 
he would ask his parents why he would see you know signs like segregating people he he was denied a library card you know and when you think of the the humiliation of segregation he just would not let it rest he would not he decided that he was going to challenge that the first opportunity so he started um, by you know writing to dr king he met he met with them and he wanted to try and integrate Troy University. He, Troy, it was Troy State College then. Um, and, you know, Dr. King told him your, your parents who had worked their entire lives to get land, which was a huge thing and is a huge thing today. I mean, not many African-American families can say they still hold that ancestral land. Um, you know, he said, your, your parents could lose their land. Their house could be bombed. So, uh, you know, he did not do that, but then he did go on to, you know, as soon as he got to college, um, I was recently on a panel with uh, Ambassador Andy Young. And he said, when he went, um, when he was at college, he saw a bunch of young people. He was like, he was with the party crowd. And then he saw a, a guy, you know, with a suit and tie and they were all marching someplace. And he said, who's that? And they said, oh, that's John Lewis. <laughs> he's going, <laughs> he's doing X, Y, Z. Um, so from a very young age, he really determined to, to fight what he saw as, you know, injustice. So yeah, so, um, so Stanley, let's talk about the college years and, and maybe you could tee up the, um, the clip we're gonna watch. Yeah, this is a, a clip that comes in in the beginning of the, of the film Freedom Riders, and it's at the just the, the very beginning. Um, what, what happens for those who haven't seen the film or you know don't know that much about the Freedom Riders is <clears throat> thirteen people, black and white, just decided that they would you know ride buses from Washington D.C. one a Trailways bus and uh, another a Greyhound bus and just get on the buses and sit together in the front of the bus, uh, interstate travel and and. Uh, ride those buses um, to Mississippi. Um, and it seemed like to them a simple thing, you know, that they were gonna just do that as a protest. Um, <clears throat> but it, it turned out to be, you know, something so much bigger than that and became kind of a, a national moment uh, in the civil rights movement. Um, and John Lewis was one of those, I think, again, the youngest of, of the 13 people that, that uh, get on the uh, buses and become what's known as the, the Freedom Riders. And, and also, so I wanted to show also the letter clip now. Is that okay, too? We can do both of those and maybe come back, um, Stanley, and talk a little bit about position them in his, in his legacy. Sure. I'm a senior at American Baptist Theological Seminary and hope to graduate in June. I know that an education is important, and I hope to get one. But at this time, human dignity is the most important thing in my life, that justice and freedom might come to the deep south. Boarding that Greyhound bus to travel through the heart of the deep south, I felt good. I felt happy. I felt liberated. I was like a soldier in a non-violent army, I was ready. So the, the letter is, you know, John's application to be a freedom writer. I mean, everybody had to kind of apply. Um, you know, one thing that, that I think, you know, sometimes we don't talk en enough about is, you know, that, that so many in the civil rights movement, you know, um, were trained, um, you know, after the, the training they had to be freedom riders in Nashville, the nonviolent training, you know, where they simulated, you know, getting cursed at getting beat and, and you know, not responding to those beatings. Um, and so, you know, he had to actually apply. And then they had to sign a waiver that said, you know, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I know that, that bad things might happen, but, you know, that's part of, you know, um, what I'll take on as a freedom writer. So this is, you know, uh, kind of the, the beginning. And, and one thing I think that we can talk more about is, is that sometimes we forget how radical, you know, this was and how radical mm -hmm. John was. This was like, you know, um, just, you know, saying, I'm just going to go down south. You know, I'm just going to, I'm going to just do it. 
Um, right. There was no national press with them. They had nobody. There were there were two reporters from black newspapers, uh, and that was it. I mean, there was there was no there was nobody watching them. They had no federal protection. They had no protection at all. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, felt that that there needed to be a change. And this was kind of the, the idea of direct action, that, that there, was, there was direct action that you could take um, to dismantle um, you know, uh, um, the systems that, that existed in the South. John, did you wanna add in? I mean, because I think also one of the things that's important is remember, again, they're very young, <laughs> very, very young, um, very brave because we're, we're talking about a time where people would go missing, right? Um, so that's also important. And um, they just they just put it all on the line. I, I, I love what Stanley is emphasizing in, in that these young people and the people who volunteered were trained. They did not just show up on a bridge. They did not just show up on these buses. There was a lot of strategy and planning. Um, and you know, when we talk today about dismantling racism, one of the things I think, you know, stories that films do is help to show, we think of John Lewis as brave, which he absolutely was, but he was also incredibly strategic, you know, in planning the way that these, these the marches would happen, the way that the efforts would happen. We need to give these uh, civil rights young people their due in terms of their intelligence and talk about their, their strategy, their successful strategy. I mean, what they did was awesome mm -hmm. to integrate interstate travel, to integrate the, you know, calcified segregation in Nashville. I mean, just mind blowing what they were, were able to accomplish. So right. I, you know, I remember watching Freedom Riders when it first came out and being so struck by, you know, the use of his own words to emphasize um, how intentional this effort was. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's something really important to focus on. Yeah, I, it's, it is pretty amazing. Their, their sense of strategy because I mean, they were taking down a whole system, <laughs> a way <laughs> of life. And you just can't do that just by showing up someplace, right? Um, to just, just add because, you know, we, we talk about this. This is just a small example. But one of the small examples was that, you know, the men would wear suits and ties. The women would wear and little white gloves, you know. Um, and, you know, so when we see the Freedom Riders or, or, you know, the protesters, you know, we think, oh, they're wearing these suits and stuff. But no, that's not what they, these, you know, wore every day. They wore these because they wanted to heighten the difference between them and the mobs, between them and the people who are, you know, wearing overalls and shouting at them and they're mm -hmm. in, in their suits and ties and the women, you know, in their dresses and stockings and little white gloves. They wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, even they, they wanted to seize the images, you know, right. so, so right. images you see are, 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 are of, of people, you know, very calm, you know, very collected, you know, very well dressed against these angry, crazy, you know, rabid dog mobs. And because one of the things they wanted to do was make, you know, people who are sitting, you know, um, at home in the South and in the North, choose a side. You have to, you know, choose one. Mm -hmm. Here are these people in, in, in suits and women in dresses or these rabid mad dogs, choose a side. That's right. It was narrative work before people were calling it narrative work. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about um, Stanley. At some point, um, C.T. Vivian, who we lost um, at the same time as Congressman Lewis, um, who um, had been in the work with Congressman Lewis at that very early, those very early stages. Talk some ab about that and how C.T. Vivian plays a role a little bit older than um, than the freedom, some of the freedom writers. Yeah, I mean, C.T. Vivian is one of those, you know, in some ways, unsung heroes of the whole movement. Um, you know, because C.T. Vivian lived in the South and stayed in the South and, and you know, had to, had, you know, had to go home at night in the South and, and just an incredibly brave individual, you know. Um, there's a clip, I don't think we're going to show it, but from uh, Freedom Summer, you know, where he's just in somebody's face, you know, like 
you know, pointing his finger, you know, you know, Adam, um, C.T. Vivian um, was just, you know, an, an amazing human being. And, um, you know, part of that, that generation that, you know, um, you know, all of us owe so much to. I mean, you know, I would never be here sitting here as, as a filmmaker. You know, there were no filmmakers of, 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 you know, black filmmakers in their generation. You know, that 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 was, you know, something that you couldn't even, you know, aspire to. I mean, as, as Dawn said, you know, you couldn't even get a library card. You know, you couldn't go to the public library. So, you know, I mean, we, we owe them, owe them, you know, all so, so much. So can we, um, we have a, a clip um, from Freedom Riders with um, C.T. Vivian, I think. group would be dispatched. The meeting was called, and mm -hmm. Diane led it, and, and I remember Diane saying something was very important. She took a break and said, go out and let's think about it for about 10 minutes and come back, and we'll make the decision. It was not an easy decision, because what it meant was dropping out of school. In the midst of our final exams, and for some of us, we were the first generation to go to college. Our parents had really made sacrifices, and we were making a decision to drop out. Time was up. Everybody came back in. The decision was made to leave that night. We take off across country. We can see a uh, people on porches and black people on the porches when you're going through the black private town they're just waving you know and we're waving back it was really tremendous no folks sitting out on the porch like they normally do and it was really a wonderful thing their hopes were on us you know and we were supposed to in fact do what we're doing and to make it so that one day their children wouldn't have to put up with what they put up with Yeah, I, I think that, you know, that that's one of the most incredible moments, you know, for me in the civil rights movement. You know, I, I should say that the first wave of Freedom Riders, you know, the 13 that get on the buses in uh, in D.C. Are, are, are beaten so badly in Alabama and, and with no protection um, that they they can't go further. You know, they, they decide that they just can't, you know, you know, they, they're, they're actually put in the hospital. They can't go any further. They decide to end the Freedom Riders. And this group of students in Nashville, you know, that, that C.D. Vivian is talking about it. And he's one of the, he's not a student, but he's one of their students. They'll just decide to pick up the Freedom Rides on their own. They, they're not part of the Freedom Rides before that. They just say, you know, they, as Diane Nash says in the film, you know, we can't let nonviolence lose to violence. So they just decide that they're gonna get on those buses and, and continue on, you know, knowing that they have no protection, knowing that the other Freedom Riders had been so badly beaten that they couldn't continue, but they decide that they're just going to do it, and, and it's just an amazing. So let's talk some about um, about nonviolence, um, because he, Congressman Lewis, was a subscriber <laughs> to um, a life of nonviolence. Um, so, John, tell us a little bit about um, that like that underpinning and that moral conviction and how um, he seemed to be um, grounded in it, despite all of the things that was ha were happening around him. Yeah, you know, um, you really can't understand Congressman Lewis's life without understanding how he was almost baptized by non in nonviolence. He accepted that as part of his personal philosophy and also his expression of, of his faith, which was extremely important to him. So he uh, studied religion and philosophy at university. So there was the academic part. He studied Gandhi and the philosophers. Um, but he also was, uh, you know, tutored by uh, Reverend Jim Lawson, who is in his 90s. Mm -hmm. and still teaching nonviolent workshops. Mm -hmm. if, if you saw Congressman Lewis's service, you saw the rousing 
uh, discussion of nonviolence uh, that, that Reverend Lawson still preaches. Reverend Lawson ha was uh, invited south by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, became kind of his, you know, comrade, comp compatriot in discussing kind of the moral, you know, aspect of the movement. And so John Lewis very much looked up and was influenced by those two to men, in addition to being influenced by the women of the movement, uh, like Mrs. Rosa Parks, et cetera. So, um, you know, when people say, why would he keep doing this? Um, it's because he was so deeply convinced that no the nonviolent, peaceful protest was the way for lasting change mm -hmm. that he didn't consider any other option. Mm -hmm. And he continued to look for ways to express activism in a nonviolent manner throughout his entire life. So I think we, we're going to go to a clip um, on um, about nonviolence and with Congressman Lewis and then um, Stanley, I'd like for you to comment. The people that took a seat on these buses, that went to jail in Jackson, that went to Parchman, they were never the same. We had moments there to learn, to teach each other the way of nonviolence, the way of love, the way of peace. The Freedom Ride created an unbelievable sense, yes, we will make it, yes, we will survive, and that nothing but nothing we're going to stop this movement. Yeah, I think that that one thing that that uh, you know to understand is that there were kind of two ways of looking at the. Uh, you know, nonviolence. And, and, you know, there was the idea of John Lewis and Martin Luther King that nonviolence was a way of life. And that was just the way of life. There was another idea, you know, at least in the Freedom Rides and the early movement that, you know, it was a technique. And, you know, you, you didn't have to, you know, adhere to nonviolence in every, in the rest of your life. But this was a technique that was being used and you had to adhere to that when you were part of the movement. And that was, you know, probably by far the majority of people who were, who were part of the, the movement, you know, that, that this is a technique we will use. But like, you know, the hardcore people like, like uh, Jim Lawson and, and, you know, Martin Luther King and John Lewis and C.T. Vivian, I mean, that was a way of life for them that, you know, that that is how you carry yourself uh, through life, you know, in, in, in a, in a nonviolent way. And, and what was so extraordinary about all those people is they had such power, you know, they, you know, mm -hmm. there's no way you could deny the power of John Lewis, you know, mm -hmm. but it was a, a, a nonviolent power. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that it did for, for, for anybody, you know, who was around him for even a short period of time and that would listen and, and, you know, had that open their minds, you know, it just kind of opened your eyes, opened my eyes to, you know, um, there was other other ways to be, other ways to, 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 to power and move with power through this world. So I want to um, uh, encourage people to put some questions in um, the chat. Uh, we will get to those questions in a bit, um, but please feel free because um, we're monitoring and looking for your questions. So um, I want to shift a little bit because maybe it's not too much of a shift to talk about John Lewis, the person, <laughs> um, because I think this is connected to his, um, who he was is also connected to the nonviolence, um, to, to being a person who believed in nonviolence. And, you know, I had a, I remember um, having, and it's funny because uh, watching Good Trouble and, and also hearing his staff talk about him, one of my experiences was just so, Apropos, um, my daughter, she was 11 at the time, 
uh, had to do a school project for National History Day, and she decided to do a documentary on the on the Voting Rights Act. And because you know, her mom was on TV all the time, she's like, I don't know what this thing is, right? So she decided to do this video. And so I um, arranged a interview um, with her and Congressman Lewis as part of her documentary. And so um, thank goodness for like iPhones because she did this whole documentary on her iPhone. Um, but I filmed the two of them in conversation, but he was late. Um, for the meeting, which apparently he's late very, he was late very often. And he came in and he was so apologetic about being late. And we're just like, we're, uh, we're fine. We could be here all day waiting for you. And so he was apologetic. He then um, says to her, I have to go vote. Come with me. And we went over to the floor of the house with him. And first of all, he walked faster than everybody around him. I, even the 11 year old could not catch up to him. Um, we get over to the building and he takes her down on the floor of the house and lets her vote, cast his votes for the day. And so she cast six votes. He introduced her to all kinds of people. She said, oh, I met this orange man. I think he's the head of Congress. Um, and then he came back and did this wonderful interview with her about being on the Edmund Pettus Bridge and just like so special, um, you know, just uh, in just being real and being very attentive to people. He always made you feel like you're special. Um, so talk some about that, Dawn, and, and kind of like, where, the, where does that come from? Because <laughs> we all aspire to be like that. <laughs> you know, um, John Lewis was, was where he wanted to be. He wanted to be in Congress. He wanted to, Nancy Pelosi refers to him as the conscience of the Congress. Um, he wanted to demonstrate through actions as well as his words that you could be, you could bring morality into the law, that in fact, that should be your guiding you know, principle, that laws that are not moral are not just. And you know, when you think about it, uh, segregation was legal but it was not moral. And so, you know, that was the compass. But um, I think he really appreciated how much he meant to people. And so he always would make time for people who would single him out. I mean, we learned very quickly that we had to add extra time if we were going through an airport or even just across, you know, filming across the Capitol. Because anyone who approached him, he would stop. It drove his staff crazy. Um, but he would stop. And so there's a scene we have in the film where people are approaching him and that's actually a mashup of so many <laughs> different times following him. Um, I think um, part of the Congressman's philosophy of, of honoring people's humanity was to give of his time and to you know, really have intentional moments with people and not just, um, you know, kind of surface interactions. I, I think those really fueled him. I'm not surprised at all, although it's like delightful to hear that he had that experience with your daughter. Because the other thing is he loves young people. Just, you know, like they fill him up. And um, I, I think when you've given so much of yourself and you care so much about your country and its future, like, it really is important to see people who you know are going to carry on when you're not there any longer, you know. And I don't think that was always top of mind, but I think that that really fueled him. That all of this had not been in vain. So your daughter wanting to do something with him was like affirmation that what he did was valuable. Oops, I think you're on mute. Let's show a clip from a Good Trouble um, of him at church. Hopefully somebody heard me. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Dice mi hijo, 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 mi Praise God. You got lipstick on the side or the front. Michael, you need to stop it. <laughs> talk, talk, pray for this guy. Pray. <laughs> I didn't ask anyone to kiss me. Hey, the little lady just woke up. Lady went right on the clip. <laughs> Michael, you're not going to assist an old man going up this step? I can't. Don't stop it. Uh, uh, <laughs> be like, oh, okay, baby, come on. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> Wash the water. Michael? What? Look, I've been baptized. You, you were just, <laughs> some water was sprinkling over your head. I went <laughs> under. What's the difference? What's the difference? You, you mean you're more baptized than me? Yes. <laughs> I went under in a creek. I had to sprinkle. What's the matter? What's the difference? That's just <laughs> some beads <laughs> going on your head. We go down under the water. They bring us back up. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Huh. So silly. <laughs> Don't let me fall. <laughs> So I, I, um, I just love that clip um, because it just shows so much about him, um, both about the role of religion, but also just his sense of humor. Um, Stanley, did you want to weigh in here? Yeah, yeah, that was John Lewis. You know, I want to see some more clips. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, I really wanted to show, you know, we see Mr. Lewis in um, his fierce moments, you know, giving those rousing speeches and people, you know, who know him know of him on the bridge. And I wanted to make the point, um, a couple of points. One is that he just loved Black people. <laughs> he loved Black mm -hmm. culture. He loved the Black church. Um, you know, he would always have those references, you know, to like the sprinkle, you know, like we all know the difference between the, Michael is his, his chief of staff is from Boston, you know, and was very much raised, you know, in a much more, you know, kind of stately service as, you know, he was always ribbing Michael about his lack of understanding of the South. <laughs> Michael is like his straight man, um, you know, but also um, to show this is, a person who loved life, who really enjoyed his life and what he was doing um, and uh, loved, loved, loved to tell a good joke, you know, and would always, and that, you know, for like filmmaking people, that was an example of always watch all your rushes yourself because that was, I was not going to walk all the way up those stairs like with them. <laughs> I took the elevator. <laughs> and so, I, but I set the cameraman up with them, you know, and then the footage came back. So I wasn't there at that very minute. And then the footage came back and that is just a gift. You know, that is, that is why I love, you know, the verite opportunity to just be with people, uh, you know, kind of be in their presence. So, so, um, Stanley, I want to talk some about um, about John Lewis and politics because he went he went from movement to being part of the system, and for some people that's a little bit of a rub, um, and they could never be part of the system. Um, but for him, he found a place. Um, so, talk some about um, what prompted that move to go into politics. Well, I mean, I, I think it's it's a natural move. I think so many, uh, you know, people who were part of of the movement, uh, especially the movement early on, you know, went into politics or, or uh, you know, somewhere or the other. I think that it, it just was fitting. And, and you know, as as you said, you know, he was this moral conscious of the of, of, of the Congress, and and we needed him. You know, we we still need. Him. We do. And, 
absolutely really important. And you know what what amazes me, you know, in a way, is is that he kept on winning, you know, and he kept on winning, and he kept on being elected. And part of it is because you know of who he was, and and you know, and that's I don't mean you know who he was as a civil rights leader, but who he was as a man, you know, that he, you know, that that you you couldn't deny that he he truly cared about people and truly you know loved all people. Um, and so I, you know, it's just it's just so interesting because, you know, he went into politics for all the right reasons, and, and we we have, it seems that that's such a rare thing at this moment that we live in, you know, for right. people to go into politics. So I, I, yeah, I know he was also really inspired uh, by uh, Bobby Kennedy's death, and by um, the death of Dr. King. And he that I know this from work on my um, work about Bobby Kennedy, that he that was the time he said he almost lost his faith. You know that after those two men were murdered that way, he thought he couldn't go on. You know like how much, but the idea crossed his mind that maybe his public service would be in the halls of Congress someday. Mm -hmm. So it took a while before he actually got there, but he said, you know, one of the things that kind of kept him going was he could help fulfill the promise that those two men, that the, the journey that he had started with those people who were very, very important to him, particularly Dr. King, was just, you know, like an older brother, really. Right. He was really, really devastated by the, and the, those losses happened so quickly, you know, one after the other. Right. It was a really hard time for him. So I want to, um, we're going to show the clip of the Dallas, his speech in Dallas, and then, because um, we're going to wrap up in a few minutes, I want to show that, and then I really would love for the two of you to just, um, when we come back, Don, and then Stanley, to talk about what does his legacy mean for this moment that we're in, um, especially for the next generation who is building on um, the work of Congressman Lewis and, and others who were who were part of um, the civil rights movement. So let's show the Dallas clip. I would see those signs that said, white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. And I would ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, and my great grandparents, why? And they would say, boy, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. But in 1955, 15 years old, the action of Rosa Parks, the words and leadership of Dr. King inspired me to get in trouble, what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. It's, it's time for all good people in this state, here in Dallas, to get in trouble. You know, I got, I got arrested a few times during the 60s. <laughs> 40 times. And since I've been in Congress, another five times. And I'm probably gonna get arrested again for something. But my philosophy is very simple. When you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, say something, do something. Get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. You know, I think that that is his legacy. That is um, just, you know, he he could he was energized and could rally a crowd that way. Um, and I know, I love the op-ed that he wrote. You know, to be published on mm. the day of his funeral. It's the ultimate Mr. Lewis mic drop. It so <laughs> is. It's so. Mm. You know, it's just uh, he knew he'd have an audience. And you could see how he can play to a crowd, you know, um, and really harness, you know, use his gifts for good. So um, I know that he was ex just thrilled to see so many people, you know, black and white, all races, all genders, marching together because they saw something that was not right. And they were, you know, getting into good trouble. Yesterday, uh, I don't know if you all saw the photos of the students in Georgia 
in really crowded hallways mm -hmm. and nobody wearing a mask. And uh, the student who posted that got suspended mm -hmm. because she violated the rules of no social media. Kind of, it sounded kind of BS excuse yep. to suspend her. But she said she was getting in good trouble, necessary mm -hmm. trouble. <laughs> So, um, you know, I felt like uh, somebody had watched his service, you know, they had mm -hmm. watched and listened and really internalized it because that's exactly the right thing to do, you know. Right. Um, so I think that that is, that is his legacy. Right. So Stanley, um, also, you know, he was one of his, the last photos of him was on Black Lives Matter um, Plaza in DC. Um, a very powerful, powerful photos of him standing with his arms crossed. Um, so talk some about that legacy and what, what is, what do we take from it? What do, what should young people take from it? You've got two young people who have been in the streets um, <laughs> protesting and um, who have been turning up. Oh, three. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. There's one that's a little older than the other two. Three of them. Um, who have been getting in, in good trouble. And so what do, you, what do we draw from his life for uh, lessons for them? Yeah, I, I, I first, first I want to say, you know, just what a gift uh, Dawn's film is. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just to have this lasting, you know, legacy uh, uh, of John Lewis. And so it's just, it's just you know, amazing to, to have that. I imagine if we didn't have it, it's just, it's just great to have it. The other thing I want to say is one thing my father said, you know, his parents were both, um, you know, neither one of them graduated high school, you know, um, they were in Washington, D.C. And, you know, it just just a little context for what John Lewis is saying there that my father always told me that's one of the things his mother said to him, don't get in trouble. Just don't get in trouble, because if you get in trouble, there's nothing I can do. Mm. And that was mm -hmm. something. You know, we, 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 we forget, you know, what one yeah. generation of African-Americans say to another. But that was one thing that they said, you know, don't, don't get in trouble because I can't help you, you know, if you get in trouble. That's what my father was, was always told by, by his parents. You know, I, I think, you know, as we're talking about journals, I just think about the journey, you know, that it's a real journey that, 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 that he was on and that we're on. And for young people, you know, I just admire them so much, you know, getting out there, you know, and, 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 and constantly, you know, keeping these protests going. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. But, you know, understand that it's a journey. You know, John Lewis, you know, was 18 when he started, you know, and, and he was 79, 80 when he, when he passed, you know. So it's a, it's a journey. It's not that things are going to change overnight. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's almost like we're trying to reach this, this thing and we'll never reach it really, but you know, but we got to keep trying and we go up and up and up and, and that's, you know, what we want, want to happen. And also one of the things that I've seen is, is, is people's lives are changed because they join in and become part of this journey, you know, from the freedom riders, to the Freedom Summer, to the Black Panthers, <laughs> every you know their lives are changed uh, because they become part of something that's bigger than themselves. And you know, in, in some ways, that's I think that's something that that we have as humans. We want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And for so many of us, you know, uh, there's this struggle, but we also you know have to do it with love. And that's one of the things that John Lewis was so was so great at, you know, and, and, and talking about, you know, we, if we, if we don't do it with love, then we become, you know, like, you know, uh, the un unmentionable names, you know, the <laughs> <laughs> he who shall not be named. <laughs> like, like what's the guy from, from uh, Harry Potter, you know, yeah, right. go Voldemort. <laughs> we, we come like that. So we have, we have to figure out how to do it but not lose our, our, our love and not lose our souls and not, not lose our humanity. Yeah, I, you know, for me thinking about um, him, I mean, it's funny that don't get in trouble. I remember when I was a student um, organizer, uh, both in college and in law school, I remember my mother saying, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, I, we, took, we took over the dean's office at Columbia Law School and I called my mother from the dean's office, this is before cell phones, so I called her from 
the phone in the uh, on the desk and she was like please tell me that's not you that I heard about on the news and I was like yeah I got my feet up on the desk and what are you, what are you talking about we shut this thing down um and you know and the, and the same mother who was an activist herself right who <laughs> like how could you tell me not to do this uh, and I think for young people, um, there are a lot of young people who have studied the lives of people like John Lewis and not, probably not in school, but on their own and Diane Nash and who understand the kind of courage and bravery that it took for them. And I do think about this generation similarly because, you know, I, do, I think it's very brave to go toe to toe with the police who you know could kill you in a second and get away with it. And that young people understand that um, you have to put your life on the line sometimes for the kind of sweeping change that we need in this country. Um, and I think that they've learned from watching um, people like Congressman Lewis. And so um, I you know, will always miss him um, I get to, you know, continue to enjoy his legacy and his story by watching your films, um, which is really incredible. I mean, Don, just like the personal side of him that I think people really needed to feel that energy about him is so well documented in Good Trouble, um, his sense of humor, his love of dancing, his love of the church, um, just really rounds out the person because sometimes we don't get to see the whole person and what made them so special beyond the things that they did. Um, so I really want to thank you for that. And of course, um, Stanley for um, telling those stories, um, going back and, and, and putting us in the midst of those stories um, is really, I think, important for, um, for those of us who do the work um, to be able to continue to go back and, and to, and to also, connect with the strategy that was um, omnipresent. Um, some people don't think there was strategy, but it was that strategy was so deep and it's so well documented um, in Freedom Riders. And so we're going to go um, to some of the questions. Um, and so we have a um, question from um, Byron Hurt, which is, um, first of all, my condolences to you all based on your personal relationship with Congressman Lewis. A question is, what is the biggest piece of John Lewis that remains with you after his death and how will it inform or shape your filmmaking moving forward? I mean, I would say it's his sense of optimism and um, kind of blessed assurance <laughs> that things will be better. I think he deeply believed in the goodness of most people and that's what he was appealing to. Um, so I think that that's what I, when I would get a few times I would say, oh, Mr. Lewis, this is happening or that is happening or, you know, he who shall not be named did this. And he would kind of like, say this is why we have to vote or we have to do this or that or the next thing and my husband started saying like John Lewis is your life coach <laughs> <laughs> um but uh you know it's hard to be optimistic sometimes and and I, I literally would say to myself if John Lewis can be optimistic I'm I have no <laughs> standing to be upset that's right nobody's ever beaten me up so, uh, right. so I think it's that. That's right. Stanley, did you want to add? I mean, I, I, think, I think it's that. And, and you know, as I said before, I think it's that, you know, it's a journey and it's a journey that you have to be on, you know, um, you know, with a certain amount of love and, and optimism. You know, I, I know, you know, my kids, you know, are, are, are out there protesting and, and they're really affected by, you know, what's happened in the last couple of months in this country, I mean, you know, and, and, you know, um, and, you know, I have to keep telling them that, that you have to be, you know, optimistic about, about the human spirit and that it's, it's part of, you know, a long journey. You know, I think that, that when this whole time is looked at, you know, you know, in a few hundred years, it'll be one long thing. 
you know, that includes, you know, the murder of Emmett Till, that, that includes, you know, desegregation, you know, um, the Freedom Rides, that includes the moment that we're in now. You know, this is just, a, it's, it's like one long movement. And I think that, that we have to think about that and, uh, and understand that. And, and again, you know, keep pushing and fighting, but, you know, you know, with optimism and, and you know, high spirits. Um, the next question uh, is whether, um, to both of you, do you, either of you plan to tell stories of the so many of so many of the unsung female civil rights activists? Um, I mean, I would love to. You know, Diane Nash is just such a badass. <laughs> she, she is, um, and she, uh, yes, yeah, she is. Thing. And you know, the the like. Props to, you know, to Mr. Lewis and to many of the other men um, who are part of that Nashville group, Bernard Lafayette, except they always, you know, give her her due in being their real leader, um, you know. Um, so, so I, you know, I would, there's not a plan right this second, but um, yeah, I mean, that would, you know, that would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we've talked about for years is doing a film about, you know, a women in, uh, of the civil rights movement. Um, you know, I, I think that, that uh, you know, we just never kind of got it off off the ground. I think that it would, you know, we have to get a woman to direct it. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, in so many ways, that there, there's so many intricacies of it. You know, the way that, that sometimes women were, were, were put into the background and like so, so, so much that happens in the African American community. You know, the women did, a, you know, um, more than their fair share of the work, um, but didn't get their fair share of the credit. You know, there, there's there's so much, you know, that that community. Um, one of the things that I love to do is is you know, kind of look at things that we think we know and then look at them in a, in a very different way. Because I think mm -hmm. that some ways, you know, um, some of the leaders kind of drop the ball on, on you know, women in, in, in the movement. But um, so I, I think that, that uh, you know, somehow, some way that, you know, someone will get that film done. Okay, next question from Penelope. It takes remarkable courage and self-restraint to use the nonviolent strategy. <clears throat> I really admire John Lewis and Dr. King, and thank you, Stanley, for making the amazing documentary for us. Still, I am confused. In the current context, when so many of our brothers and sisters have died violently at the hands of systemic power that doesn't embrace us with the same love and morality as we hold, do we have to keep using nonviolent strategy in the coming battles against structural racism? How do we not lose our calmness, original insight, and principle? I mean, this was the battle, and clearly Stanley can speak to this, having done both Freedom Rides, but also Black Panthers. You know, this this was the um, the conflict, you know, that John Lewis is replaced as the head of SNCC by Stokely Carmichael, who was advocating a more, I guess, direct action. But I would love to hear what Stanley says about that. Um, you know, I always kind of liken it to, as Stanley said, um, that was a tactic for many in the movement, a tactic that the times called for. I think Mr. Lewis and people who believe as he did, believe that the longest and most lasting change is through nonviolent means, which include the vote, right? Which include organizing, which include education. All of those are nonviolent direct action means of social change. Um, you know, I, I think that's a question we all have to ask ourselves. I am a, of the personal belief that um, responding to violence with violence usually does not benefit our community. We lose. <laughs> we do not control the police or the hands of power. And so while I understand the frustration. Um, you know, it, it would be terribly sad if that was, if it was, if that was the, the, uh, solution. But I think that that's, that's a very real conversation, you know, like, what would that look like? Um, and, you know, it's kind of the two wrongs don't make a right situation, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I one, one of the, uh, 
African American leaders. I forgot who who it is right now. It might have been James Lawson went in the 30s or 40s to India and talked to Gandhi. You know, and what Gandhi said is that you know they were in the middle of their struggle, and Gandhi said, "Well, the real test of nonviolence is going to be in the United States, mm. because in India we're the majority, and we are going to win. There's no way we're not going to win. We're the majority, but in the United States you're the minority, and so it's 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 a little bit different there. You know, we'll see. Um, look, you know, if if you talk about if we're talking about violence, you know, we're one tenth of the population, you know, so it has to be a nonviolent. Well, what are we going to do? Go up against the army? You know, we can't, you know, it's not going it's to, it's not a good look, you know, so we have to figure out how, you know, nonviolence can work. On the other hand, you know, um, one of the things that, that it said in Freedom Riders, you know, is that you know, one of the, the, the Freedom Riders didn't want any violence to happen, but they also knew that if violence happened, you know, that it would be in, in, in the newspaper, you know, and that, that they would get into. You know, we saw with George Floyd, you know, stuff was getting burnt down all of a sudden in the news 24 hours a day. Um, well, so Portland, it, you know, there's still protests happening in Portland right. and you don't see them because there's not people getting tear gassed. <laughs> So it, it, it's about, you know, so, I, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to get on a, a, you know, a Zoom call and call for. <laughs> Please don't. Being recorded. <laughs> Please don't. Because <laughs> I, I don't feel like trying to get you out of jail, Stanley. <laughs> but, you know, like, to Fox News, noted so, so, documentarian calls for violent overthrow of the government. <laughs> It was Dawn Porter who did that. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't, you, you know, what, what, what's the end game strategy? You know, violence leads to more massive violence and more massive violence, you know, in, in a way that, that we, you know, you know, we don't, we don't have the, uh, the firepower. So, so it has to be nonviolence. It, it, it just, mm -hmm. that's, that's the only, only way you can win. I, I think one of the, the things that, that we saw in, in the, uh, you know, the recent movement is, is that, you know, you have people of all kinds, of all colors, of all ages out there protesting. And so, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you have the high ground because you have, you know, uh, it's not just a, a few, you know, African Americans or a few people of color. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, it becomes a movement. I think that's what's important. Well, thank you both um, for this incredible conversation. And um, more importantly, thank you for the films that you have made. Oh, and one thing, you know, yes. you know, Dawn's film is out there, right, Dawn? How can we see it? Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's on Amazon and iTunes. Uh, you can you can rent it. So it'll be up for another you know month or so. So please, yep. please do I, watch. I rented it. Go rent it, Thank people. you. <laughs> you don't want to miss it. So also a plug on my own, you know, on PBS and all their wisdom has we released uh, Murder of Emmett Till, Freedom Riders, and, and Freedom Summer. Uh, and they're on uh, PBS.org and they're streaming for free. So if you want to see those films, that's a place. Free. free. So no excuses. Um, so I, do, I want to thank both of these incredible filmmakers for um, keeping our history alive, um, keeping Congressman Lewis with us so that we can learn. And, um, you know, let's get out there and keep getting in good trouble because the world needs it. So um, thank you, and I'm going to turn it back over to, I think, Marsha or someone from Firelight Media will be joining us to wrap up. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Beyond Resilience. Thank you to Judith, our moderator, and our panelists, Stanley and Don, as well as to our ASL interpreter, Andrea. Beyond Resilience will be going on the road. Catch us at the Black Star Film Festival, August 22nd, and IDA is getting real in September. Watch previous episodes of Beyond Resilience on our website at firelightmedia.tv slash beyond dash resilience. Bye. Bye.